Meeple Nation podcast episode 510. Meeple Nation January 2024 news. It's our first news of the year. Yay. Love it. Welcome citizens to Meeple Nation. Grab your favorite beverage, pull up a chair, warm up those dice, and join us at the game table as we discuss board games and the board gaming world. Each week, the hosts of Meeple Nation share their love for board games and the amazing memories that come from playing games with some very outstanding people. Let us now join our hosts in their natural habitat, the game table. Welcome News 2024. The Meeple Nation podcast is sponsored by Game Toppers LLC. So we talk about our Game Toppers all the time. We talk about what an amazing product they are. But one of the things that I was thinking about this week, Andy just put up a new table down in his game room. He kind of swapped out one of the tables that goes under the topper. While we were over there, we kind of helped him move that out, got out the the Mycroft that goes on top that had been taken down, and we set that up on top of the, the new table. And as we were setting that up, I was looking at it and I was like, this thing looks brand new. And how, how long have you had that? Um, at least two years, maybe a little more, two and a half. Yeah, with game nights at least once a week, if not multiple nights a week, still looks brand spanking new. Military grade aluminum with the powder coat just looks absolutely phenomenal. Berkey, he really makes an outstanding product. Go convert any space into an epic and amazing game space with a game topper. Check them out at GameToppersLLC.com. And just a side note, that's even with the spillage that happens. Oh, seriously. Now these two Watsons that we're on tonight, I mean, these are four, four and a half years old. And yeah. they're still very versatile. I don't really see any wear and tear on them. Quality of the product is really good. I mean, we could spend quite a bit of time talking about Nathan getting frustrated and Hulk smashing the table. We could talk about Dave's nervous ticks smacking and tapping and doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, they just take it like a champ. Rolls right off of them. Keep thinking about picking up one more table. Me too. Do you? <laughs> yeah, of course you would. Out top me anytime. I love this because here's what's going to happen. You guys are going to run out of space. You're going to need a place to store them. And guess who needs one at his house? <laughs> <laughs> but I would love to get a um, Mycroft, but I just don't think my space, because this room right here is, it's a nice big room, but it's a very long room. I mean, where we're setting up in the studio, we might be able to fit a Mycroft in there, maybe transition the active table in that room. And then these two Watsons in here. Consider pulling that trigger and getting one more. Nice. Yep. These game toppers are solving all of our problems and meeting all of our needs. Go check them out for sure. We are the hosts of Meeple Nation. I'm Nathan Howard. I am Andy Holiday, And I am Douglas Stewart. We have a webpage that you should go check out. It is full of all sorts of Meeple Nation goodness. Blogs, feeds to our Instagram. There are links to every episode that we've released going way back over nine and a half years now, loads and loads of Meeple Nation. Talking about older episodes, our friend Salvatore messaged me a little while back. He was talking about going backwards in time to see how bad we really got. He sent me an answer and replied that, yes, my answer to your question is, yes, I am still working through your back catalog of episodes. It is by no means a completism slog. And I love each one of them. They are, in fact, a board game analyst time capsule. He's enjoying and uh, seeing how uh, we've improved. and Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> we do it for history and science. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we can launch it into That is this, our motto. Into space and the next Challenger, a space probe. We don't uh, share our motto often enough. We don't, no. We're doing it for history and science. History and science. I wonder if people even knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> But he goes on, he says, I've listened to every episode for the last three years, and then circa 2020, I started to pick and choose the episodes I listen to. The episodes that I may skip are your monthly news episodes because that information contained was perishable, and occasionally I'll skip a game episode that I have no interest in. But with 2020 hindsight, that being said, I still listen to at least 80% of your your pre-2020 catalog. Wow, that's impressive. That is impressive. I certainly haven't done that. Maybe Julie and Dave are probably the few people that have listened to every episode. Poor Salvatore going through those 2020 episodes. That was when the the pandemic was in its peak (laughs) and we were recording separately at home. And oh man, that was such a challenge to try to instantly learn how to pick and paste our episodes together. And oh, that that was some really rough times. 
Things have improved, and hopefully we have. I feel like we have, anyways. All that can be found at MeepleNation.com. That, and there's also a link to our Patreon page there. We love our patrons. They make a lot of this new advancements that we're doing happening. We've picked up some new hardware. We're, uh, we're working through that, trying to piece together a whole new technology that we're learning. For us, individuals that have regular daytime jobs, get together to play games, finding the time to piece together this new technology. It's not always a priority in our lives, but we are definitely trying to get to it. So thank you, patrons. If you too want to be a patron, jump over to our, or skip. You can, however, meander over to our, our webpage, meeplenation.com. Click on that Patreon link. You too can be a patron of the Meeple Nation podcast. I hear an Uber will even take them there. Yeah, you could get an Uber <laughs> to the Meeple Nation podcast. This week, for our highlights, we were very fortunate to receive a box of some games from Good Game Publishing. These were some games that got to pick and choose a little bit, so we picked some that uh, we thought would appeal to us. Those games were Mercurial, Guildmaster, Fluttering Souls, and Trick Draw. Today, for our highlights, we're going to talk feelings and dive a little bit into each of these four games. And spoiler alert, Good Games Publishing makes some good games. They do make some good games. Let's start off with the short and simple game, and that is Fluttering Souls. Fluttering Souls is a two-player game, plays in 10 to 20 minutes. According to BGG, the weight on this game is 1.25 out of 5. So very light game. Doug, you and Lydia got the chance to play this. I got the chance to play this with both Dave, with my wife Cheryl, Andy. No one wanted to play with you, apparently, so... Yeah, that's okay. I can't blame him. (laughs) I probably had my angry pants on that day. Every day? (laughs) What are you talking about? When was the last time you've taken those off? Yeah, they they need to be washed. Yeah. (laughs) They're starting to stink. (laughs) No, we did get the chance to sit down and play Fluttering Souls. And I have to say, I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoy that mechanism where you've got a tableau of cards that people are drafting from. I, in particular, like it where some of those cards are face up, public knowledge, and some of them are face down, hidden, kind of to be revealed as the cards that have them sort of locked into place. The cards underneath them are revealed or are taken, I should say. When those are gone, the card becomes unlocked. You flip it over, reveal what it is. Think Seven Wonders Duel, Truffle Shuffle for anyone who's played that one. Both of these games use the same mechanic and they use it really well. Let's just take those three as an example. So let's take Seven Wonders, Truffle Shuffle, and Fluttering Souls. I like Seven Wonders and Truffle Shuffle way more than I liked Fluttering Souls. But both of those take a significantly longer amount of time to play. Absolutely. It says in there up to 20 minutes. When I sat my wife down and taught this to her, I taught it in five and we played our first game in five. Took and shuffled it up really quick and we played our second game in about five. So in 20 minutes, I taught her and we played two games. If you like that core mechanism, and this does it well, it's very simple, just trying to draft these butterfly cards. And it has right on the side of them, depending on which ones you gather into your own tableau, how many points you're gonna get for grabbing those butterflies. And that's it, trying to draft the highest scoring hand. Pretty simple, but it plays really quick. And if you like that core mechanism, I think this is a great game for two players to play really fast. This is the kind that can go in your backpack when you're traveling, something that you can just bust out. It would fit on, for example, an in-flight tray. I think it works in particularly really, really well for that. Now, if you want to sit down and have more of a crunchy experience, I think there's some better games out there. But this one, I think, fits that niche. Great game for two players that plays really quick and utilizes that mechanism really well. Yeah, and I think that's what the target of this game is. I'm going to throw in another game to compare it with, and that is Jaipur, where Jaipur, you're playing the best of three rounds, right? Somebody has to win two rounds, and that's the same thing with Oh, sure, sure. Different mechanism, but you're going to play it until somebody wins, which will involve multiple rounds. So yeah, that's a a good one to throw in there. There's five butterflies that you're going to claim. The first person to claim three of those butterflies wins the game. So your games could go anywhere from that five minutes to 20 minutes, depending on how many rounds that you have to go through. I think very much for its target, it is spot on of, hey, this is a quick 10, 20 minute game, play through it all. Andy, referring to you, something that you could play while you're waiting for your food at a restaurant, very quick, very versatile in that aspect. Yeah. And we're always looking for games that fit that that criteria, something that we can, small enough to fit on a table that we can play in five, 10 minutes tops 
and that is still enjoyable. Yeah. And I'd put this right there in that very accessible, quick time frame game to play. Fluttering Souls is a great two-player game. My wife very much enjoyed it. And it's something that actually is kind of in our regular rotation now. That's very cool. So that's Fluttering Souls. I'm really excited to talk about Mercurial. All right. Mercurial was awesome. I really enjoyed my play of that game. Now, it took me a minute to kind of grok what the game was trying to have me do. There is definitely some depth and complication. The best way that I can describe Mercurial is it's like Century or Century Golem, whichever version you prefer to play. It's like that, only on steroids. It's amped all the way up to 10. Uses a lot of the same mechanisms, a lot of the same flow of a turn. Will be familiar to people who know how to play that game. Like I said, this one was ramped all the way up. A lot of stuff to kind of bite down into, a lot of things to think about, and I thought, really fun game. I mean, we go from Fluttering Souls, which is a 1.25 on the weight scale, Mercurial 3.13, and it very much is that. It is, as you would call it, Doug, that very crunchy version of Sentry. Very beefy. The theme of the game is... Fantasy. It's a fantasy theme, (laughs) yeah, which, well known, is not my favorite theme, but still a good theme. Your caravan arrives at this Camp Trinity to settle on top of the ruined kingdom, like many that were here previously, to seek out better fortune, discover new spells that are going to allow you to achieve and to execute heroic deeds. Now, to execute these heroic deeds, you need to have spells. This game, I know, Andy, you played this before the rest of us. You got the chance to play this with your daughters at BGG. But this is definitely a die-rolling game, which for you, I'm surprised you volunteered to play this. Well, the nice (laughs) thing about this is there is a lot of die mitigation in this game. I I would almost say that really is kind of the core of the game, is getting your dice to, to sort of flip and maneuver them in the way that you want. So... Okay, yes, there is an initial roll, but like it doesn't really matter what anybody rolls. Through the course of the game, depending on the spells that are available, you're going to be manipulating and maneuvering them in a variety of ways, no matter what. If you are like turned off by the oh, quote unquote dice game, I wouldn't be scared off by this. This is not a dice game. Yeah. It uses dice, not. but it's not a dice game. Yeah. You're gonna roll those game you're gonna roll those dice at the first of the game. And then you won't re-roll those dice ever again until you've cast. And once you've cast and you use up all your dice, then you're going to go ahead and re-roll them. Realistically, you're only really rolling these dice maybe five times a game. Right. Unless you have a re-roll ability on a card. That's true. But the dice mitigation are the cards you're playing to change the die faces. Specific characters are going to have certain strengths with certain die faces as well. So there's some asymmetry to it in the game, which I really liked. Sierra actually picked this game out to play, and she, poor thing, read the rules, and she's like, okay, I think I got it. Yeah, she didn't. The (laughs) rules are actually a little bit difficult. Yeah. They didn't make a ton of sense. I had actually cheat and go to a video, and then after I'd read the rules and watched the video, it all kind of came together. All the information, to be fair, I think was in there. It was the organization. Yeah. Yep. So when you set it up, you have the the heroic deeds, and then below that, you're going to have the alteration cards, and then below that, you're going to have the spell cards. And so on your turn, you have your choice of two actions. The game's really simple. You have two choices. You can either cast spells, or you can pick and draw. You're not going to cast spells early on. you got to pick and draw a couple of things first. So you can pick one of the alteration cards, and like we mentioned, those alteration cards are what allow you to manipulate what faces on the die. They give you the opportunity to play more alteration cards. They allow you to gain acuity. All of those will allow you to purchase spells. And so when you get to the point where you're going to purchase a spell... So really quick, Nathan, for people who are familiar with Century, and I I do think it's a good comparison because I think a lot of people are familiar with that. I won't beat that drum too hard. Those alteration cards, they're like those gem cards from Century. You gather those and then you can play them down one card at a time. You decide, but you play those cards down. They basically let you upgrade your gems or gain new gems, that kind of thing. Only in this case, rather than gaining gems or upgrading gems, you're manipulating your dice, which I think is a really nice twist. I I like that quite a bit. And so you can use those cards to gain those spells. Each spell is going to require an element, which is one of the faces that is on your die. And then most of those cards will also allow you to integrate mana in place of an element If you don't have enough mana, you can use two acuity to replace one mana. 
as you grow, you put all these resources down in your, your spell tableau area. And then once you have enough resources, you're going to try to commit that heroic deed. And to do that, you have to acquire power. You have to require ruin power, like ruin, R-U-I-N, or restore power. As you align these spells, each spell is going to give you either power or give you either ruin power or restore power. And then when you get enough, then you can look at the heroic deed row and try to attempt one of those. And that process was, I thought, really cool. You're acquiring those alteration spells, you're playing them, you're manipulating your dice, then you're using those dice in combination with mana and acuity, purchase those spell cards. It's like it's like you're charging the spell. I loved that part of the game. You're charging it up. So you're going to put some dice and some resources on that card. You're going to kind of put it off to the side and it's like, okay, that's locked and loaded. I, I got that ready to go. And that spell is going to generate, like you said, a certain amount of ruin or restoration. But then you kind of have to match it with other things that'll go and, and I like the way that the game did that. There's a balance between that ruin and restoration because they'll actually cancel each other out. You could, you could cast a dud spell if you didn't do it right. The other aspect that I really liked about it is you put those resources on the card and set it aside, meaning if you've used half of your dice to purchase that spell card, you've only got the other half to buy more spell cards. Sometimes you need three or four in order to really cast the big spells. As the game goes, as you perform those heroic deeds, you kind of gain more more mana, more dice to your pool. At first, you're casting smaller spells, and then as the game goes, you're casting these big spells where you're, you're kind of just blowing all of those spells that you've got resources on down in front of you all in one big push to perform those those heroic feats. And, and that feels really good. I'm pumping resources into this, cocking the hammer, so to speak. Boom, it's this big explosive spell that goes off. I really like that part of the game. As far as the ruin and the restore, you totally could cast a dud spell. However, if you cast a completely neutral spell, it's not a dud spell at all. If you can get complete balance between yes. the two to ruin and restore, you'll look at the equilibrium table, and it's going to tell you exactly how much energy you produce in order to complete one of the heroic deeds. That's not something I have ever done in this game. I can't remember which one of you... I did. Uh, it was you that, that ended yeah. up getting equilibrium between the two. And it worked out great for you. It was it was a huge hit. It was very cool. There's a benefit to that, but there should be, because that is not easy to do. Because you're looking at the spell cards that come out. The amount of restore it gives you, the amount of ruin it gives you, they're kind of all over the place. Yeah, because it has to be in an exact balance. It does. You can get cards that will give multipliers to those two types of energy. That's something that's not easy to do, so... I like the fact that, okay, if I'm going for that, the payoff is big. I think that's well done. And then something to keep in mind is once you cast those spells, those spells are gone. They go to your discard area. You could refer to them for points at the end game. But for the most part, to go after those heroic deeds again, like you said, Doug, you got to go through all of that work to stage, prepare, and get that cast ready to go again. The game does that very well where it is, it's not just an easy Harry Potter wave of your wand. There's a lot of work <laughs> to go through to get these spells ready. Mercurial does it so well. They do. And I feel like the one of the biggest keys is managing your mana and your acuity in that. There are spells that will require specific elements to cast. Quite often you are given an option of spending a die for that specific element, or you can spend mana. Found myself trying to use as much mana and acuity as possible to save my dice, because there are spaces that you actually have to use a die for. You can't spend mana or acuity in, in order to fill one element on the card or two elements on the card. If I had the option to use mana or acuity, I was doing everything I could to save my dice and use those resources. Now mana, when you cast that spell, all your mana goes back into your mana pool. However, you lose your acuity. So that's something that you have to try to acquire during the round as you're gaining those cards. On the row for the spell card, if you get the leftmost two spell cards, there's a discount of either one mana or one acuity to your casting. You know, maybe makes it a little more strategic on what you're going to take because you can get a discount and maybe get a, one more spell card in when you cast to make it a little more powerful or to get one of those achievements that are available casting for, I think it was four spells at once. An achievement is going to give you bonus points at the end of the game. And there are two others that will give you bonus points if you manage to fulfill the requirement. First person that gets it, that's it. You have that and no, everybody else misses out on it. Doug, going back to, I know you love multi-purpose cards. Yep. And those alteration cards have just that. So you can have an action on them that you can take and manipulate your die. However, if on the next turn you don't have that face, that card kind of becomes dud for you, you can actually discard that card 
And when you discard that card, it's going to have an alternate ability, either gaining you acuity or allowing you to re-roll dice. And, uh, and then there's something else. I can't remember what else it is. A lot of dual purpose with the cards. Touching a little bit on the dual or triple purpose cards, because a card can be super powerful at the beginning of the game and then be completely worthless towards the yeah, end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And having a way to get rid of it for a benefit or to use it in some other way, I think makes the game that much more versatile and that much that much more strategic. You are limited on your hand size as well. So being able to get rid of a card, call that card or discard that card for a, some sort of benefit, whether it's gaining an acuity or whatever that is printed on the card so that you can get a card that's going to benefit you more later in the game. Huge. That's awesome that they did that. Very much enjoyed this game. It's one that I tried to teach my wife. Her eyes glazed over, but now having <laughs> several plays under my belt, I think this is something that she would actually really enjoy. And I just got to get the time to sit her down and be able to get her to experience that game. I think this is something that she could handle, even though it is heavier side, but it's short enough. It's something I think that she could digest fairly well. Mercurial was a game that we all enjoyed. I very much enjoyed it. I've played it several times now, and you've played it. How did, actually, we didn't ever hear. Sierra thought she had it. She decided she didn't, and you played it. How did your post-game experience feel with you and the girls? Both Sierra and I really liked it. Went through the rules really fast again, so both of us had read the rules. Between the two of us, we figured it out. Amara, she struggled with it. She had no clue what was going on. She was distracted with boyfriend stuff half the uh, game, so I don't think she was very invested at the time. As far as myself and Sierra, we both really liked it. It was that's Mercurial. We all liked it. Let's roll back a little bit and let's look at one of the other lighter games that we got. And this is Trick Draw. I love trick taking games. This has nothing this to do with This is not it. a trick taking game. Yeah, it was, <laughs> I was a little bit taken back that with trick in it, it should be. Play on what you have in front of you. Andy, tell us what you thought of Trick Draw. I thought it was just a fun, quick game. Similar to the other card game we talked about, it maybe not quite that quick. It took a little longer than five minutes, but I think we played it in, what, about a half an hour or something like that. Turns are really simple. You draw a card, and you play a card, or you draw a card, and then you draw two more cards. And that's really your choice. And when you play a card, you can choose to play it face up, be able to use the ability that's printed on the card, or you can play it face down, and it will count as a point for you. Face up cards aren't necessarily worth points, but some of them can be if that's what's printed on the card. If they're face up, their actual value is zero unless it specifically says this is worth points if you meet these requirements. Like, for example, there's a card in there that if at least half are turned face down, that card is worth three points. But if you don't meet that, then it's worth zero. There are a lot of cards that will flip your cards over and that will flip your opponent's cards over as well. That happened to me several times. I had cards that were synergizing super well together. Yeah, and we had to make sure we stopped that. And you tried. I know. Unsuccessfully. <laughs> Very unsuccessfully. But I do like the fact that there is a, that engine building aspect to it. There are a lot of ways to score points. And one thing I noticed is that we ourselves didn't play a lot of cards face down. I mean, we did a little bit. We were using them for the face-up abilities because, frankly, that's where I think the interesting stuff of the game takes place. For sure. It is. And some of the abilities are, like, crazy powerful. I was able to eventually play two cards every round, and I was drawing tons of cards. Now, in my starting hand, there is an option. If you have the right cards, you can win the game outright just immediately. And I had one of those two cards in my starting hand, so I thought, okay, I'm going to go heavy card draw and just try to draw as many cards as I could. Yeah, I never found it. Because I had it. Because you had it. <laughs> and it was face down in front of me. I figured that it probably ended up face down in front of somebody. But the uh, but because I had so much card drawn and I could play two cards every single round, I found cards that synergized off of each other really well. The game ends when somebody has 10 points. Triggers the end of the game, rather. Once that happens, whoever triggered the end of the game, whoever got the 10 points, gets two cards placed in their tableau face down. So it gets an extra two points. An extra two points. And then everybody else gets another turn to try to score as many points as they can. And whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. However, I love this part. If there's a tie with anybody, all the tied players score zero points. So <laughs> you could make it so that you're trying to give somebody else points, which seems totally wrong. Yep. But if I can make it so Doug now ties your 12 points and I only have three points, well, you two are both eliminated. And three uh, points takes the game. Three points takes it. That adds a whole nother layer of strategy. Not only that, it makes it very beneficial to memorize where your opponents played which cards, especially if they played them face up and they ended up face down, so that you know what to flip over. Yeah, because you can't rearrange those cards you once cannot. they're down. Yep. 
there's a lot of memory involved with it. There's some engine building, obviously tableau building, and it, it was actually really fun. I thought that your starting hand, you kind of formulate a strategy like you usually do when you play a game like this. There wasn't a whole lot of time. The game's pretty short. Short games are awesome, and I love them, but it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah. You want to build an engine that you want to see it to fruition, or you have the strategy, and you just can't quite implement that strategy to what you had envisioned at the beginning of the game, and then the game ends. I think it's kind of interesting that you're talking about building an engine and developing a strategy. I think you got good cards to the point where you were able to do that. I didn't feel like I really had a strong direction to begin the game, and my game was more reactionary. It was more like draw. See what the best thing is I can do with this card, do that, and then move on. I wasn't ever really able to get anything to really synergize, not in the way that you were. Okay, this is my way of saying, because you are drawing blind off of a deck of cards, I think there's a heavy luck element when it comes to the quote-unquote strategy. I think you could get the right cards and develop a really great strategy or engine like you're saying. Also, your game could be completely reactionary to what other people are doing. Now, I'm not saying that that's not fun. And I'm not saying that the person who's just reacting to their cards doesn't stand a good chance of winning. I'm not saying that as a negative. I'm just saying because you're blind drawing, it's not going to be the same for every player, every game. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think more than just the luck, usually don't have much luck. I think it had more to the fact that I was drawing a ton of cards. Yeah, for sure. So I was able to to find the cards I was looking for. You start your turn, you draw a card. And then if you don't play anything, you can draw two more cards. And that was for Doug and I. That's what we were doing. But for you, you would draw a card, and you had another card that let you draw a card, let you draw a card. And you were drawing like five, maybe even six cards, while we were drawing three at the most. And then hopefully doing something on the next turn, you were drawing five cards and still doing something (laughs) on that turn. And then doing something else. And so, yeah, that synergy, I mean, there is an element of luck to it. Yes, Doug. But there is also, it's a very short game. It doesn't give you a negative feeling, like kind of like playing a game I can't stop and the dice just don't go my way. It's a take that game, but it's not a feel bad game. Exactly. Dave and I played this two player and it was by far a much different experience than it was playing at four players. Played it with my wife. The theme didn't really care for her or she didn't really care for the theme. She tolerated it just fine. Dave and I very much enjoyed it. Then when I got to play it with multiplayer with all of you guys, from two players to more than two players, it was a very much different game. Because there's more variety out there. You can't necessarily go searching for that one card because there is a lot more places that one card can be. For sure. Yeah, it would definitely be harder to win the outright way in a three or four player game. Yeah, still very versatile, still very enjoyable as a two player game. It had a little bit more, I feel, I'm going to use my air quotes there, as complexity as uh, as a multiplayer game, as a multiplayer game, as a multiplayer game than it did as a two player game. One thing to note on this and also going back to Merc- Mercurial, the artwork on both of these games was phenomenal. I oh, really yeah. enjoyed it a lot. Mercurial in particular, but I love fantasy, but the artwork was... Oh, this is a fantasy Western. Yeah, and it, it was beautiful. The, the artwork was great. It was just stylized in a fun way. I mean, it's just a deck of cards, but yes, I, I would agree. For a deck of cards, it was a pretty deck of cards. The pictures <laughs> on it were nice, and Mercurial, everything was beautiful. Trick draw, fun game. Not we, a trick taker. Not a trick taker. <laughs> uh, leads us into the last one, which was Guild Masters. Now, this was the one that I didn't get to play. I was not here the night that you guys played it. It looks like a whole lot of fun. It looks like one I would really like, and I definitely want to play it. Tell me about Guildmaster. This is when I was dreading playing the night we played it, because it was me, Nathan, and David, and I thought, this is going to be a really, really long game. And I was probably one that took the longest And it was. It was Nathan that took the longest. Dave did amazing. Very surprised how quickly Dave made decisions. I was beside myself. I couldn't believe it. Even with my longer turns, they weren't long turns. The game didn't last over two two hours. hours. Give give a little golf clap for Dave. Yeah. This is my golf clap. Way to go, Dave. Go, Dave. I was proud of him. (laughs) He had been away for school most of the time, so we had the opportunity over the winter break to be able to reacquaint ourselves with Dave a little bit. And maybe this going back to school has maybe spurred up some of his decision reaction games. He might have died a little bit on the inside, but uh, he takes faster turns. <laughs> to get back to you, Doug, Guild Masters, two to four player games, plays in about 60 to 120 minutes. And on the weight scale, 2.89. So not an overly heavy game, but definitely more complex than Fluttering Souls and Trick Draw. Players are managing their adventure guild. So you are in charge. You're going to try to recruit adventurers and use them to complete 
contracts. Common contracts, there's heroic contracts, there's legendary contracts. So you say that, and I'm already thinking uh, Lords of Waterdeep. Sort of. Okay. But, so not, but not necessarily. Not, not okay. to that complex right. of a level. That description, just that in my brain, that's kind of where I went. But okay, keep going. Yeah. You also have the ability to upgrade buildings that you have and buy some other buildings. So again... <laughs> so I'm still, still right, right. Okay, Deep. Lords of Waterdeep. This is what I'm thinking right now. And then you have the opportunity to recruit new adventures. <laughs> still there? Wait, I'm waiting for the divergent point here. <laughs> okay. So this is where it gets a little bit different. I have a starting hand of four novices. I can assign up to two of those novices to an order. At the beginning of the game, two orders that I can perform each turn. The way the board is laid out from left to right, the first section is the round tracker. The game plays in nine rounds, and you'll go from either a full moon to a half moon. Every third moon phase is a blood moon. Some of your adventures will have actions that will apply to either any phase the half moon phase, the full moon phase, or the blood moon phase. You can play them anytime, but this bonus doesn't take place until they're in this moon phase. Are they lycanthropes that will <laughs> turn into werewolves and eat the citizenry? Nope, not quite uh, there. Ah, darn it. What an opportunity missed. As players decide on what they're going to play, they're going to take one of these actions on the board. In their two order sections, they're going to put an action card or uh, an order card, I think is what it's called. And they're going to commit. I'm going to commit two heroes to go here. I'm going to put this order card here and I'm going to put two more heroes here and this order card here. This is all done behind my little shield. So you can't see where I'm doing. Now I could take the time and say, hey, Doug, what are you doing on your time? Andy, Andy what are you doing in yours? Uh, we can kind of try to negotiate. So I really want to go to this. So if you let me go there, I'll let you have this. And at the first of the game, that's not going to be really or obvious. Or if you dare go to that spot, I'll take this pen and stab you in the face. Yeah. Okay. So at the first of the game, that's not really going to factor much. But later in the game, you're going to really be going, okay, hey, I want to go on this. Try to do some wheel of dealing. And none of those are binding by any means. So... You can agree to that or and then totally not do it. I'm going to go through and I'm going to commit these orders. Mm -hmm. Then everybody's going to reveal their orders and we'll go to the action phase. Resolves from left to right, the build section, and then the recruit section. There's six recruit sections that are called A, B, C, D, E. And then there are six contracts that are one, two, three, four, five, six. And my card in my order section, has to associate to one of those locations. At that point, we're going to resolve orders first. We're going to check where everybody's going. Doug, you and I are going to build section. Andy's going to recruit at position C. Left of the board, first thing is a build phase. We're going to look at that build phase. You and I are in conflict because we're both going for the build phase. One of us is going to have to go first. Whoever goes first, that build section is cheaper. And depending on what you're going to build, you're going to require one to three builders. If we're going to look at our two cards, it's however many cards we put in there. Each of those adventures has a series of skills that they each have. And each of those skills that they have has a number next to it. And that number dictates how many die they're going to roll. So we're going to have a face-off. We're going to each uh, going to roll. You have to roll dice. Yes. Uh. Whoever has the highest is going to go first. Even though I'm going to the builder, I don't need to really put any heroes there. You always want to put two or more. Or if you feel it's not that important to you, you can do one and put your other one somewhere else. Either way, you have to have somebody there in case you are in conflict. And make sure you put your money on your card. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Andy and I both did that, where we were planning on doing something. Because if you don't commit the money in that order section... You can't take it from your bank or your reserve and put it there. If you didn't commit that money to begin with, oh, you can't use your money. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, because on top of that, you have to plan. If I went first, I'm going to require three builders. I can take the two builder and the two three builders, meaning that my build is going to cost me eight points. Whereas if you go before me, and even if you use two of those, you're going to take the two and the three. That's going to leave me with the three and the four and the four. So it's so, more expensive to hire your builders the later you go. So yeah, you want to go first because your builders are cheaper to hire. Gotcha. And if I don't have money on that order for the more expensive build, I can't build. Or if you don't have any on there at all because you <laughs> forgot. <laughs> you can't build. Very key. We would resolve that. 
then the next thing, the recruit phase, the adventurer phase. And since Andy picked number C and he's not in conflict with anybody, he would go to that location C. He would hire that adventurer. Again, having to have the money there. But in this section, if there is conflict, Andy and I were trying to recruit the same adventurer to break that tie. It's whoever put the most money. He could be in the half moon phase. He could only cost me three gold. However, if I put five down there because I was worried that Andy was going to go to the same place and then Andy doesn't go there, I just overspent for this guy. Any money I committed is going to hire that adventurer. Finally, you go to the contracts. Each of these contracts are going to have skills that require, and they're going to require a threshold, meaning a number of pips that need to be rolled in order to complete that contract. And if you're the only one there, you can go, you can attempt that. And if you're successful, you take that, you get the rewards, and then you can replace that location with either a heroic one or a legendary one. Or if you want to be lame, you can just replace it with another common <laughs> one. And we replaced them mostly with common ones. <laughs> <laughs> the difficulty is definitely increased with the heroic and the legendary ones. Going back, if there is a conflict, first off, we have to negotiate. We have to say, okay, who's going to get what? We decide who's going to get which re which rewards. We come to that decision, and then we're going to take our conflict token. And if we all put it face up, we all agree to share it, we'll attempt it and then divide it as normal. If one of us chooses to conflict, saying, I don't really want to deal, then that individual is going to try it on their own first. If they're successful, they get it. If they're not successful, then everybody else can attempt it. If you work together, pick one skill, everybody's going to roll their dice of that skill. They'll roll their dice independently and hopefully meet that threshold. And uh, otherwise, you're trying to do it in conflict. A lot going on there and a lot of negotiation. We've been playing some Moonrakers lately. I, I, okay, I was just going to ask you because it sounds like uh, it sounds like Moonrakers. Yeah, but not. Yeah, well, <laughs> the negotiation in this is not anywhere near as complex. Oh, so, so this game is just Lords of Waterdeep uh, meets Moonrakers. Kind of. Okay. <laughs> but we all were kind of a little hesitant about this game. We all very much uh, enjoyed our experience of it. Additional plays as well. Yeah, th this is one I really do want to get to the table. I want I want you to, well, actually, you just taught me the game, so I'll just go back and listen to it, and then I'll know how to play. Yes. But <laughs> this one looks really good, too. I can't wait to get this one played. Yeah. One of the things that I focused on in this was getting is my tavern upgraded as quickly as possible. Collect money, but when you have you upgrade your bar, you get more money. And if you can get up to the level three bar, and only one person can get the level three of each of the four different upgrades. If you're lucky enough to get multiples of those, you're that much better off and that much more powerful to perform tasks in the future rounds. Like I said, that's going to open up slots for you to take on more contracts because you can take up to four contracts if you get the fully upgraded, I can't remember what, what room that was that you were upgrading. You have the four slots, but you can't use them until you upgrade. You can do up to four orders. So you start out by only being able to perform two orders on a turn. But as you upgrade, you can unlock the third slot. And then if you get the level three building, then you, that opens up that four slot for more orders. So that means you can do more things on the board. It's almost like gaining an extra worker. But you have to have the adventures in order to fuel those abilities as well. And I love extra workers. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> you have to be more flexible about what you're going to do. Because if you're executing four orders, and if you're playing in a three to four player game, and everybody is executing four orders. Well, only could everybody else could only do three, get, right? Yeah. So I guess if there's 12 orders executed, and then on your fourth one, you're trying to execute the 13th order, chances of your target still being available at that time is pretty slim. At that point, I mean, you have a way throughout the game to collect common contracts if for some reason aren't able to or choose not to perform the action that you've committed in that order. You can attempt one of your private common contracts. Or you can wander, and wandering is you're going to roll your dice, and then depending on the number result, you're going to acquire gold or fame. Golden fame. I think you will like this, Doug. I sat down to teach you, but I was a little rusty on the rules. I'm totally ready to teach you again. And like you just said, I've pretty much taught you the game already. <laughs> there's some nuance that I'm still missing there and a little bit of uh, touch because there's some ways to be able to get some independent end game scoring for each contract you've completed. You get an extra point, each heroic contract, then you get three extra points, something like that. Each player can get one of those, and there's six or seven of those that are available. You're just going to go, and whoever has the most fame at the end is going to be 
the Guild Master Extraordinaire. Sounds fun. I love it. Those were the four games that were sent to us. And I think we can agree that all of them hit on various levels, though I do think uh, Mercurial was the one that really won us over. That one was, I think, a very superb game. They all have a place and they all have an opportunity to get it played with us for sure. Absolutely. Tons of fun. Tons of fun to talk about. We spent a significant amount of time talking about those four games. Definitely worth it. And we we love it when we have the opportunity to play new stuff. And especially when that new stuff is sent to us by a great publisher like Good Games. Like Doug said, we've spent a lot of time talking about those, which are taking place of our highlights, a long highlight segment. But let's quickly dig into some of the news stuff that we want to talk about. Yeah, we got some fun news. Let's start. Some new game releases. So these are things you should be able to find out in the wild right now. And I would love to start us off because there are a couple of them in particular that I am very excited to get to the table. The first one, Everdale, Farshore. Talk to me. How excited are you about this? I, we, we all like Everdale, right? Yes. I like Everdale. I love Everdale. Hey, Logan's, Logan's not here, time. so... We, yeah. we don't have to pretend that we don't like Everdale. That's true. Logan has such a sour <laughs> experience. I forgot that. Yeah. No, I enjoyed Everdale. This one looks great. This uh, isn't like Wingspan where you pretend to like it at first and then no, come to find out you hate it. Yeah. I don't hate Wingspan. Good I just heavens. would rather play most anything else. <laughs> wow. Wow. We like Everdale, and, and Everdale Far Shore looks pretty good. Okay, here's what I'm worried about. It does look a little bit like just kind of a, maybe just a re-implementation of Everdale. I mean, it does have the Everdale name. My fear is that they have not created a new enough game, not deviated enough from the original. I think it still uses a lot of the same core elements, but I'm excited to get this one played and it is hitting store shelves, order it online. I'm excited to play this one. Got an 8.0 on BGG with a weight of 2.92. So we'll have to see that how that one plays out. Yeah, I'm excited for that one. Like you said, I hope it's just not a reskin. It looks good. I'm going to talk about a couple of trick-taking games, which are not necessarily my favorite, but... You, I love trick-taking games. You do love trick-taking games. And one in particular stands out to me, and that it's a trick-taking game called Bacon. I also love bacon. Me too. <laughs> hey, I is, like bacon. Which is why I decided <laughs> to look at this, because I love bacon. You play in teams. Four-player game, you're obviously a two teams of two, trying to shed all of your cards. You have the option of just playing one card, and it's like a lot of trick-taking games. So if I play a blue two, then everybody else has to play higher than my two if I play a single card. However, I can choose to play sets of cards. So I can play a, a pair, or I can play, and it has a list of a, a whole list of different cards that you can play. Everybody has to follow with that same combination of cards. So if you can't follow, then you have to pass. It can be beneficial to play those in sets because you're getting rid of cards faster. You may force somebody to pass if they don't want to. They can't play anything. And there's no trump in this game. There is a way to play a card that doesn't follow that, though. So the trump, the quote-unquote trump for the game, there are special sets that you can play. Each of those sets has a different level of power, I guess. So certain ones will trump other ones. The weakest special set is four of a kind, and it can go up to a straight flush. Six of a kind is the most powerful of the special combos that you can play. And you can play that and it basically beats everything. If your team wins the trick, then you get to play first or you can choose for your teammate to go first. You're the one that won. You can have your teammate go first if you think your teammate has a better chance of winning the next trick. Once somebody runs out of cards, that triggers the end of the game. However, the game continues until the teammate of the player that ran out of cards completes sheds the rest of their cards. And then they will score points depending on how quickly they were able to shed their all of their cards before the other players. If they shed their cards before the other two players in the other team, they're going to get four points. If they shed their cards after one player gets rid of all of theirs, then they're going to score two points. And then finally, if they're last, they're only going to score one point. The points are these cool little bacon pieces, which is awesome. <laughs> bacon this, bits. Does this game include actual bacon? No, but, well, yes, and, but it's plastic. Although Sorry. it's not actual bacon. And I don't think it smells like bacon, but that would be awesome if it did. That would. Oh, scratch and sniff. This is the next thing that board games need. Scratch and sniff component. So my kids will open up game boxes and just smell games. And they have specific <laughs> games that they will open up just to go smell. Weird kids. I love them. <laughs> They're not weird. I love the new game smell. But, it's a little weird. But my daughter's like, not all games smell the same. Like, oh, that one, that one in particular smells amazing. I don't remember which one she said. They have specific games that they love the smells of. Okay, that is a little weird. If they had a bacon-smelling game, you'd probably catch me in the game room smelling boxes, game boxes too. 
it just seemed unique in the way that tricks are played and that you gain tricks and the fact that you play combos of cards instead of just playing cards. You're playing on a team to win the game. It's you either play eight rounds and whoever has most points wins, whichever team or first team to eight pieces of bacon wins. And there are bacon cards, which are wild cards that you can play. So they count as anything, which is also cool. You just like talking about bacon. And that's bacon. Who doesn't? Yeah. Bacon. I'm, I'm hungry now. Let's, let's go get some <laughs> let's bacon. Let's go eat. One I'm excited about, recently added to the shelf of shame, Katna Hora, The City of Silver. This is a historic city building game. Two to four players. It is all about managing your economy, supply and demand, being able to balance that. Each round, players take turns selecting actions from the hand of double-sided cards to engage strategic plans like mining, purchasing plots of land, gaining permits, raising buildings, gaining profit. Everything's about gaining profit. And of course, working towards the construct construction of the cathedral. All cities need cathedrals. The asymmetrical nature of the game provides abilities for guilds to go different directions. I like this. Andy, you really love asymmetric powers. I do. And so I'm really excited to get this game to the table, find any way to achieve fortune and be able to create and expand a beautiful cityscape. We picked up, looking forward to giving it a shot. Yeah, I can't wait to play this one. This one's generated some buzz recently. Uh, it's on a lot of people's lists. I think it's doing rather well. I think people are really enjoying playing this one. It's got me excited. I'm catching the Kutnahora fever a little bit, and I'm, I'm looking forward to playing this. I hope you'll teach it to us fast. Soon. Soon. i got so many games to learn and teach. I'm excited about that. Another one that I'm excited about that just hit shelves, Final Girl Series 2 Special. North Pole Nightmare. What a title. <laughs> yes. So this is part of the Final Girl series of games. This is part of the Series 2 box, but it's a it's a special. What they did was when they ran their most recent Kickstarter, they had this one kind of locked and loaded. And for everyone who got their stuff in soon enough, they actually shipped this and it arrived before Christmas, which I thought was very cool. Series 3, which was the Kickstarter they were running, is not going to show up till sometime much later in 2024 potentially even 2025, depending on how production goes. So it was very cool that they had this locked and loaded, ready to go, this special prize for people to get before Christmas hit in 2023. I got my copy. I haven't had a chance to get it to the table quite yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. Final Girl is awesome. It pits all these uh, all these kind of nightmarish creatures or villains against little villages or camps or houses full of people where they're out trying to murder everybody. And you are one of the final girls who has to go and take them out and rescue as many people as possible. Well, this one takes place in Santa's village, Krampus, and he is out to get the elves. Nice. <laughs> just the theming and kind of the twist on this uh, just sounds really, really great. It's got the tried and true uh, Van Ryder quality production with the box and the magnets. It's got the fantastic uh, art that you come to expect from Final Girl series. And uh, I know this one isn't one that really makes your radar because it's a solo only game, but uh, Final Girl's really good. Uh, I can't wait to get this one played. I do find the appeal of solo games out there. I have so many other games that I got to learn. I get it. Yeah. I just disagree. I can respect <laughs> that. I was making my goals for 2024 going through my app. It could autofill my unplayed games. And I really am embarrassed to admit that there is 400 plus games on my unplayed games. <laughs> wow. Holy cow. That's bigger than most people's collection. <laughs> yeah. That's way bigger than most people's collections. Wow. Okay. <laughs> we. All right. We need to have a purchasing freeze. And we need to get these games played. Because here's the thing. I'm willing to bet that probably 300 of those 400 are great games. I'm sure they are. <laughs> Maybe even all 400 of them. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. Okay. Shifting gears here just a little tiny bit. Have you guys been playing much of Spirit Island? No. I haven't played it in a long time. I really enjoyed this game. Most of my plays have been solo. I own this game, and I've never played it. Okay. So there's a new expansion that is just hitting the shelves, Nature Incarnate. You said you own this, but you've never played it. Are you collecting expansions in anticipation of playing it someday? Somebody has an issue of collecting unplayed games. Depends on who's asking. Because apparently you should be really excited about this. Full disclosure, I tried to play Spirit Island like three or four times. I had a, a group that I was playing with, and they really loved it. This was like their jam. This was their thing. Man, I just could not get into Spirit Island. It just was not for me. And I tried. I really tried. I, I think it's very creative. I think it's got a lot of good things going for it. Just not the cooperative experience I would want to have at the table. Blah, blah, blah. Not, not really my thing. 
apparently uh, this is one to be really excited about. I believe that this is their heaviest expansion yet. This clocks in at a 4.37. Wow. If you've played it and you're familiar, some of those spirits that you can play that defend the island, they can get very complicated. Oh, for sure. A lot to try to digest to play some of those characters. So I think this has a lot more of those crunchier, heavier spirits to play. But this has a 9.4. No kidding. Yeah, 9.4 rating. So I may have to pick it up. People are liking this uh, nature incarnate. Yeah. <laughs> there was a little, <laughs> uh, when shame. Andy said that, there was a little wink across the table that you couldn't see. But uh, yeah, Andy and Nathan gave each other a little wink like, like yeah, our problems are still 2024. There's still issues. It's going to be a good year for our purchase acquisition disorder. Oh, boy. I got extra space. I got shelves for Christmas. You got new shelves, yeah. (laughs) Well, you go pick it up, and then maybe we need to play this again. Maybe I just need to try it again. I want to like it. I know it's really highly rated. I mean, it's way up there on the BGG Top 100, Spirit Island is. Yeah, we need to play it. I I have everything, I believe, other than the nuke, this new expansion, so you would think I would have played it by now. Maybe I just need to find the spirit that just sings to me. That's what it is. (laughs) All right, what other uh, new game releases are you guys excited about? you have anything else? on your list you guys i have another trick taking game oh um, good wow i yeah. love tricking taking <laughs> wait <laughs> nathan, i love trick taking hang games. on hang on nathan how do you feel about trick taking games you know what andy i you know what doug i love trick taking games <laughs> awesome well this one's this is another one for you it's not as fun as bacon but it's lunar it's also a team trick taking game you're playing in teams or you can play individually so instead of eating bacon we're eating cheese no Instead, you're playing cards that depict the different cycles of the moon or nocturnal animals. Oh, you, and, okay. You lost me with the nocturnal animals. Sorry. Because we uh, all know the moon is made of cheese, right? We, we're... Well, maybe the, maybe you get both. Maybe you get your cheese and you can have animals too to <laughs> share it with. This whole dialogue is getting cheesy. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Again, we digress. <laughs> Each round's played with 12 tricks. Each trick can have a different number of cards in there, and the the score is going to depend on the number of tricks that you took and the number of cards in each trick. First person to get up to 30 points, or for the first team or player to get to 30 points wins the game. So far more simple than Bacon. Seems it seemed to be. Bacon seemed to be more of one of those more complex, heavier trick-taking games, one that I would probably be willing to play more of than just the standard, this is a trick-taking game. There wasn't a whole lot of information to understand the nuances of the game, but I know that Nathan loves trick-taking games, at least so I've heard. There is that rumor circulating, yes. Anyway, I figured I would bring that to the table so that Nathan could purchase another game <laughs> for his shelf. Oh, you just see sucker on my forehead, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> so the last one on my list of new games coming up is Fabled. The Spirit Lands. Not like Spirit Island, but this does have a cooperative element. Downside, it does have that semi-cooperative element as well, which I'm not a big fan of. It is not semi-cooperative. There's only one winner. But anyways, the end of times is coming. The gods have ruled over humans and spirit worlds for eons. But soon the time will come for them to depart into oblivion to the verge of the universe facing its rebirth. The gods have entrusted its regions to the worthiest among the sage brotherhoods of humans. The greatest contest has begun. One neither world has seen before. You're expanding this map. I do love map expansions and being able to build that as you go. Exploring the lands, the spirit world. Your sages are following the paths, trying to visit all the places to get your influence out there. A lot going on. This is 2.56, so not super complex, but it does have a lot going on. One to five players. It has several mechanics that I love. It does have the cooperative play, area movement, so you're moving across that board. For me, the biggest part that has me excited is I like games where you're doing that map edition where you're exploring out games like Explore It, uh, Searching Out, Exploring That Land. I think this is going to be good. Plays in 40 to 75 minutes. Nice short time frame. Looking forward to that. That is Fabled The Spirit Lands. And I will also just make mention as I'm looking through pictures here on BGG that the art does look uh, very good. I'm getting Ascension vibes from a little bit of it, yeah. but also some of it just looks like really outstanding, like like much higher quality. I mean, not, not that Ascension was bad. I'm not trying to throw Ascension under the bus, but um, I'm getting some of those vibes, but just better. Ascension had a lot of hit and miss art. On yes. It. Yeah. And this all looks like hit. 
Yeah, from, this looks from what like I've seen, consistently from, good. Yeah. yeah, so I'm very much looking forward to this. The colors on it seem to pop. Very elegant artwork. Yeah, that's exciting. It's going to have a table presence that I'm looking forward to. And again, that exploration. I love exploring in games. Cool. Well, I have a couple others that I'll just make mention of really quick. First is uh, there's a game out there called General Orders. Uh, I did order this. It's sitting on my shelf. I just need to learn how to play it. This is by Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson. So these are the two of undaunted fame. This is a World War II two-player head-to-head Axis versus Allies uh, game that uh, can be played in 30 minutes, so it's not a heavyweight game. But uh, just having that design pedigree and the general theme, this has me really excited to sit down and learn and play. Again, that's General Orders, World War II. That was just hitting the shelves. And then the other one I was going to make mention of is uh, Mycelia. So this is a little... uh, mushroom themed game and as i recall andy you got to play this at bgg last year right we did yeah it, I, it was actually sierra's favorite game until we played comet it's oh, cool. a great game we we played it multiple times too yeah it's a fun little deck builder it has a really cool mechanism for the dewdrops. so what you're trying to do is you are you have dewdrops on your board the whole point is to get all the dewdrops off your player board you start out with a bunch of dewdrops on there and then others will come in so when you get rid of dewdrops, you're filling up this center bowl in the middle of the table and as soon as it hits a certain spot, depending on the player count, you spin that whole bowl around and they all dump out. And there's a die that will dump out too, and it will tell you how many dewdrops come on the board and exactly where they go. It's kind of a cool little game, cool little deck builder. There's some some very unique aspects of it that I haven't seen in a deck builder before, which there are so many deck builders out there. So if any way that they can make it unique and replayable, I think is awesome. And I think with Mycelia, they did a pretty good job with that. Yeah, very cool. Well, I'm, I'm excited to hear all of that because this is one that caught my radar because it did look kind of unique. Um, it also clocks in at a 1.8, so fairly light. Yeah, it seems I like a that. great game to play with kids. Play this one with my daughters or something like that sometime. As I had said on a, or one of the earlier podcasts when we talked about BGG last year, we played a ton of new games at the, at the very beginning for the first like two or three days. And my daughter, Amara, her eyes were glazed over the last several that we did, <laughs> and she was done with new games. Day we left, we had time in the morning before we had to leave to the airport, and we played Mycelia like three or four times. And it was one that she she had grasped easily enough, and even though her brain was burnt out and we'd only played it the one time, she jumped right into it and it was fine. So yeah, I would say that's probably about right, 1.8. And even though it's more on the simple side, it's still really fun. Seems like there's enough there to draw even the most veteran player. Yeah, I think so. On that note, let's transition to new game announcements. Uh, I have a new game that's coming out, uh, should be coming out this year, and that game is called... I was going to say, you do? Wow. I, I did. Wow. Did I say it that way? Didn't know, didn't know you'd been designing. I'm just so excited to play this twist here. <laughs> but there is a new game that's coming out this year, and it's called Mycelia. What? <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> and I, was, I thought it was great that you ended your list with that game. But this is... A different game, same name, different designer, a little bit more difficult on the weight, plays in that 40 to 90 minutes. Massilia is a dynamic game of tactics in a competition for space and resources to create your own mushroom kingdom. The game follows the life cycle of fungi, a journey of creation, expansion, death, and rebirth. In game terms, growing mushrooms to score points, sprouting them to expand your network, and eventually seeing them decay and unlock special actions. So this reminds me a lot of Earth. This has an Earth vibe to me. It does have an Earth vibe. I get that vibe too. And it also reminds me a lot of um, Small World. Oh, really? Small World, you're starting off, bring in your new mushrooms, score with them or do whatever, and then they're going to die off. So kind of like a Small World, you're going to bring in your faction, and then that faction is going to nice is going to die out, and then you're going to come back in with a new faction. So I, I, I can see where you went there, though I do feel like that's a little bit of a stretch. because you've, sure. you've got all these mushrooms in front of you, and you are. You're, you're sort of growing them and then decaying them for benefits, yep. that kind of thing. So it's not like a whole faction like no. sweep, but, but it does have that, I'm going to get my use out of this, and then I'm going to score off of its decay, out of, off of its yep. death or it's going away in some yeah. way. And I, I like that. I think it's kind of a cool thing, especially with the mushroom theme, that works. And there's been a lot of these nature games that have been coming out recently. I mean, you, you mentioned Earth. Uh, this, I think, is going to fit right in there. Very different than the Mycel that we just talked about, which also does sound really cool. The whole, the dew to fall off. I really like that idea. This is definitely a different feel than that. 
more of a kind of a Euro style feel to it, but this game looks really pretty cool. And so that is my seal. And just so you can mycelia, this is mycelia. And just so you can compare the two, this one is designed by JJ Neville published through split stone games. That one actually looks really good. I'm really excited for the third game of the South Tigris trilogy that is going to be coming out this year. The third one's that. What was the second one? The second one. Don't ask me that right uh, now. Uh, Scholars, right? Scholars, yeah. What Scho- was the first one then? Don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Give me just a second. I'll tell you. <laughs> it's Wayfarers. Okay. We started out with Wayfarers of the South Tigris and then Scholars of the South Tigris. And now we have Inventors of the South Tigris. I love Shem Phillips. His, his games are just awesome. And the South Tigris series, the South Tigris series has been fun and very unique from the West Kingdom and the North Sea. Interesting how he can do this and just make such unique games that all have the same feel. Like all the South Tigris games have the same feel. All the West Kingdom games kind of have the same feel, but they're all very different games. But in this game, you're striving to build clever contraptions to impress your peers. And players are going to primarily score points by inventing, building, testing, and publishing their devices. Players can also score points by training craftspeople, developing their workshops, researching, and then, of course, influencing the three scientific guilds. It follows a lot of the same mechanisms that are in the first two games. There's the deck slash pool building, worker placement by using dice, hand management, and then, of course, the area control and influence for those guilds and earning points in a ton of different ways. Very typical for Shem Phillips, Phillips game. And I'm very excited about this one. Cool. I only played, I think it was the, was it the Wayfarers? I think I played that one one time. Yeah. I haven't played Scholars yet. feel a little behind the curve on these uh, Shem Phillips games. I'm excited to play them and I hope we can get those played as they come out. Like I said, I still need to play Scholars. I think you'll like Scholars. I know that you kind of had mixed, there were mixed reviews on your end for um, Wayfarers. I just, because it made me feel stupid. I couldn't figure it out. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think you will necessarily feel that way with Scholars. Okay. I think Scholars is one that's a little bit easier to wrap your head around. Cool. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm super looking forward to it. Uh, also of note, since we're talking about Shem Phillips and Garfield games, one of the games on my list is, uh, like a sort of ancient Scottish themed game called, uh, Scarabray. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but this made it sort of onto the uh, BGG hotness list. It was like number one for quite a while, a little while back. Um, but this is, it's a Shem Phillips game published by Garfield Games, and it's basically a worker placement game. It does look really good. It says the aim of Scarabray is to gather various resources in order to feed, clothe, and shelter the growing number of settlers. Players take turns drafting cards and using their workers to furnish, cook, craft, clean, and trade. So I, I think the thing with this is that it's combining worker placement with uh, sort of your cards, kind of augmenting the worker placement aspect of it with the cards that you play at the same time is kind of the vibe that I get. Maybe even make some car- comparisons to like Endless Winter, which is a game I really like. Um, it seems like it might have some of those commonalities between the two. So uh, it's one that's on my radar. I'm super excited about it. So this is a new game announcement, not coming until 2025, oh, that's unfortunate. But, it, but it was just announced. So nice. I'm, I am excited about that. Excellent. That sounds cool. The next one on my list, a dice rolling game. Got your name all over it, Andy. Are they D6s or are they D12s? They're D6s. Dang it. Maybe they're D4s. That That's would be, a little better. That would be more thematic, but I doubt it. Uh, nope, they are definitely D6s. And this game is Pyramid Dice. You're right. D4s would be better. It would be better. It would be far more thematic. The D4 wouldn't stack like these <laughs> D6s do. So on the Gaza Plateau, best architects of ancient Egypt are called to imprint the mark of the pharaoh. It's not just a matter of building tombs, but erecting actual engineering masterpieces, monuments that will be worshipped and will forever raise the honor of the pharaoh to heaven rolling dice and use dice and card combos to make everything work out sync that timing best you can to get control of core elements and use that as your strategy for the game this is fast and deep Uh, the game boasts a high replayability hopefully that's true with many dice games, I find that as true. Pass to Pursue of Victory, very different. Also has a solo mode. Doug, I still do play games solo, but I do find it far more enjoyable to play games with others. But I'm looking forward to this. It's similar in theme to like Emotep, uh, some of those other ancient Egypt games. Pyramid Dice coming out soon. Very cool. 
this episode is going long, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw out some rapid-fire new announcements. Uh, the ones that kind of made my list won't uh, talk about them very long because I know you guys had a couple crowdfunding games that you wanted to get to. So I'll just toss some of these out. First of all, the Quacks of Quedlinburg Duel. This looks interesting. Yeah, yeah that which does. got it was announced in uh, German, but Quacks of Quedlinburg Duel. I'm excited about uh, a duel version of the Quacks of Quedlinburg, uh, which I think is a fantastic game. World Wonders, Mundo Wonders Pack, an expansion for World Wonders, which is a game that I know our group has played quite a bit and has really fallen in love with. It's a great game. This is going to add some more wonders to that game, as well as a new play mode, which I'm hoping means there's some new maps as well. A game that I just picked up that I'm hearing a lot of buzz about as being a really great game. I just picked up Nucleum, and I can't wait to learn how to play that. It's still in shrink. I have it on my shelf, but they just announced an expansion for that. This is Australia, Australia-themed expansion to Nucleum. Uh, and then also Brotherwise Games, who you might know from uh, Call to Adventure fame, just announced that they are doing a Mistborn, the deck building game. So right now there's no BGG listing for that, but they have announced that they're working on a Mistborn themed deck builder. That's cool. Yes. So, and that, that's, that's awesome. So, you know, if you're not familiar with Brandon Sanderson or the Mistborn series, man, go out and check it out. It's super, super good, especially era two with wax and Wayne, um, fantastic books. And I'm excited to see what they do with a deck builder for that. A few others that just kind of caught my eye that I'll rattle off. There's a evil corp from the moon. Vampire Village, and a new installation from Tiny Epic, another Tiny Epic to throw on your shelf, Tiny Epic Game of Thrones, which uh, is going to make a lot of people excited. Game of Thrones does absolutely nothing for me. I, I didn't read the books. I didn't watch the show. I'm not into it at all. But I know a lot of people like Tiny Epic, and a lot of people like Game of Thrones, so that's one that's going to make some people out there happy. A couple others, Shackleton Base, A Journey to the Moon, The Eternaut, and... Last, but certainly not least, one that I am very excited about, Wormspan. That does look cool. Right, Nathan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a killjoy. I actually have that in the notes. Nathan is a total killjoy. <laughs> I think it looks amazing. I'm excited. It, I it looks kind of cool. I mean, what, one I of the know. first comments you heard a lot of people make when, when Wingspan came out was, man, how cool would this game be if it was dragon-themed or something like that, right? Like a fantasy theme instead of the birds. I think that the bird thing was the right way to go. I'm not criticizing that in any way. But yes, a dragon-themed wingspan game is something I'm very excited about. For sure. Make it more fun. I mean, I do like the whole idea of the delving into the caves, expanding that to hatch your dragons and yeah. expand yeah. that. I think that looks pretty cool. And I do agree that the dragon theme appeals a little bit more to me. But I don't know. There's just something about wingspan that just makes it so I don't want to play it again. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, and, and we should we should make mention, went out of their way to make sure people knew that this was not just a reskinning of Wingspan. Yeah. No, this it's is, very different. I mean, it's built on the same system, but it has its own unique flair and style. Yeah. Have, you even, sure. have you even played Wingspan since you got the nesting box? Dost thou even hoist? No, he has not. No, I have not played so since. The, my my daughter is already uh, begging him to sell her the nesting box. Why in the world she would you buy the nesting box? Man. If you don't, don't like My the wife game. really likes the game. We tried to play it on BGA. That's your problem. No, that's not my problem. <laughs> it is. Well, that is a problem, but that's not, not this problem. <laughs> the game just kind of fell flat. Oh, I mean, but she really liked the game, but just the playing it on BGA, she's just like, yeah, I don't want to do it on here. And, no, and then no, I just no, got, grumble, 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 and negative, I just got to the point, negative. like, what am I going to teach you? I just don't want to play Wingspan. <laughs> well, maybe you'll want to play Wormspan because I'm super excited about it. It looks really cool. Yeah, I will does. try it once. <laughs> Good it heavens. Wow. Oh, Nathan. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to rattle off through mine as well. One that it's not on uh, BGG yet, but it's Ninjas Unleashed. And it's an ultimate strategy deck building board game in a world of super ninjas. I'm sold. That sounds good. It's a 4X game. So if, if mm. anybody's in a 4X, into 4X games, it's also a deck builder with super ninjas. I think that right. sounds pretty awesome. Sounds interesting. 4X deck builder with ninjas. Yes. I'm in. Roth, it's a midweight chip theory game of dice drafting and area control. I don't think you can say chip theory and midweight 
in the same sentence. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> it is true. We'll see how it goes. But supposedly it's midweight. Uh, and then there's Naturna, New Beginning. It's This is played in a post-humanity world, and players take on the role of intelligent animals. Exploration territory building game with elements of area control, worker placement. You can discover human technology. There's a tech tree that you can move up by discovering that said technology. There is, however, a little bit of take that in it. So those of you who don't like take that, I don't know how extensive that is, but typically with area control games, there is sometimes an element of take that. Last three on my list. They all look pretty good. Pathfinder, Elemental Stones. It's two, four to player game where you're going to draft and play colorful hexagonal tiles to try to match patterns in the Pathfinder world. Cool. Maybe have some interest for you there. Uh, another one that looks really pretty cool, uh, at least from the cover art, The Veil of Eternity. Players are tamers who are hunting various monsters and trying to tame them to uh, become minions. Pretty cool game there. So 30 what, to 45 minutes. Yeah, so what I've heard about this one is that it kind of has like a TCG style kind of feel, like almost like magic or something like that, only it's all in one box. I like that. So very cool, right? Because because I do like those types of games, but the endless collectability, mm-hmm. ugh, out, yep. right? So if they can kind of capture that magic and box it in a in a digestible form i mean i've actually pre-ordered this one so i this one should be showing up at my house nice. soon i hope next one is i'm going to totally slaughter this anunkiai yep you did how would you say it then i don't know i'm just agreeing with you <laughs> anunakai uh, uh, anunaki anunaki Okay, talk to the guy who knows Japanese. Anunaki, Dawn of the Gods. This is one to four player game. Hefty weight, 3.48, 60 to 120 minutes. This is also a 4X Euro game uh, set in ancient dystopian past where mythology and science fiction come together. Each player represents a different house whose rulers are viewed by terrestrial population as gods. So you roll as gods, you're going to recruit troops, embody gods, and explore territories. It actually seems pretty cool to me. I think it's worth mentioning this is by Simone Luciani. He has really been firing on all cylinders lately. He did uh, Nucleum, which I just talked about, uh, Rats of Wistar, which is one we've talked about. There's this Anunnaki uh, Darwin's Journey that a lot of people are really liking, Tylatum, Golem, Barrage, Marco Polo, Newton. He has some pretty amazing games. So this is definitely one to put on your radar if uh, Simone Luciani is, is your jam. That's an amazing list of games. Jumping off something else is a game that I'm excited to something I can get my wife to play, and that's Moreland. Two to four players has a very similar feel as like King Domino, but definitely does not look like King Domino. Tiles to put together your land. It's up to you to manage this land's fragile and fascinating ecosystem and its uniquely adapted creatures. It almost has a look of Uwe Rosenberg game. It's like an Uwe Rosenberg and King Domino had a baby. This game is more land. I'm looking forward to it. It's one I'll yeah. be picking up. By Stefan Bogan of Camel Up fame. That sounds really good, Nathan. All right, right, let's go to some crowdfunding. What do you got, Andy? Actually, the game I'm most excited to talk about, this is going to be on GameFound, and that is Reign of Hades. Each player is going to take on the role of one of the powerful Olympian gods that have been imprisoned by Hades. You are going to be striving to reclaim your divinity. This is a narrative dungeon crawl campaign game. Oh, there it is. Dungeon there it is. Crawl. There it is. Narrative dungeon crawl campaign game. That is a trifecta right there. Uh, it focuses on strong character development and cooperation of teams of two characters. So in a four-player game, you're going to team up with two of the different characters to do different things in the game. I love the fact that they're focusing on character development. That's one of my favorite things about dungeon crawls and the, the RPG style of most dungeon crawls. And if it's focusing on the narrative and the story, as long as the story is good, it really has high potential with that theme really looking forward to it. It looks amazing. It will end up in my game room for sure. Play that makes that me place. happy because that means that I don't have to back it because it does look really good. It does, it does look does. really good. Another one that I have backed, just a little card game. It's called Aqua. Interesting little two-player game. Laying out cards on a grid. One player at the end of the game is going to score the rows. One player is going to score the columns. And it's just a two-player game. You're going to be playing cards, and when you play a card, you can, you're either going to play it face down or face up. And it depends on if you're playing a card next to face down cards, you play the card face up. If you play it next to face up cards, you have to play it face down. As soon as a card is completely surrounded, you get to flip it. At the end of the game, you flip all the cards that are face down, and then you're going to score. You only score rows or columns. The numbers on the cards cannot be lower than 10, 
if you sum them up or higher than 20. If they are, then that you don't you score zero points for them. It's pretty straightforward. Most points wins. There's a few other nuances of certain cards have to be placed, like the turtles have to be placed next to waves, and you have options to make cards score a few more points. It's just this really quick card laying game, trying to decipher what the other player is trying to do, what they're laying down face down. There's a memory game uh, involved with it, trying to remember what cards you placed where and what the value is, essentially trying to get your rows or columns into that range of 10 to 20 points. Anyway, it looks good. It was the price tag was great. The I did the early board early bird. It cost me seven bucks to yeah, back. I, I just saw that. Yeah, day one seven bucks for a little card game that looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah that's and awesome. The artwork's on it's great too. It is eight dollars and for shipping in the U.S. I don't know what it is for the rest of the world. For a little card game, it cost me you know fifteen bucks. Great, that's a great price. It jumps up to ten bucks for the entry level pledge. After day one, you know, if you're in the U.S., 18 bucks to purchase this little card game, two-player card game, really can't go wrong with that. The next one I wanted to talk about, the last one actually, is Rogue's Gallery. This one looks interesting. The card game where you're collecting rogues and jobs. You're playing on a on a 4x4 grid of cards. Each player has a 4x4 grid. On the top row and on the first column are your rogues, and then all of your jobs are in the bottom corner. Now, important to note here, we are talking about actual rogues. Typically, when you mention a rogues gallery, you're talking about comic books, right? Like uh, the Flash's rogues gallery. Yeah, this is actual rogues. These are actual rogues. These are actual rogues. So this is a fantasy theme. There's a little bit of take that because there are things that you can do that will affect other players. So there's a little bit of player interaction, a little bit of take that, that is involved. This is a new publisher. The early bird price, so day one price, was reasonable. It was 20 bucks. It goes up to 50 bucks after that. And it's just a small deck of cards. I mean, I thought that was a little steep. I mean, you get a little bit of Betsu Games swag. It's Betsu Games that's publishing this. It's their first game they're publishing. With a $50 price tag on just a, a card game, it, that seemed a little steep for me to want to jump into. However, you could do the $500 pledge. and Because suppo- that's more manageable. Well, and supposedly be you get put on their board of directors. So there you go. If you want to be a member of the board of directors of Bezu Games, five hundred dollar pledge, you're in. Yeah, that's a new one. That is that is new. I've never seen wow. that before, but there it is. Maybe we should do that for us. Five hundred dollars <laughs> a month, and you're on our board of directors. There you go. It was unique. I'm not going to back this one. I already backed Aqua, and I'm definitely backing Reign of Hades. Some pretty good, decent Kickstarters though that are coming up, Excellent. That are, or that are here at this point. Jump in there if any of those sound good, and back away. Yeah. Get in there and back away. Get in there and back away. <laughs> but not in that way. <laughs> Jump in there and pledge. <laughs> well, I, I have to tell you, this is one of our longer episodes. I, I know, Nathan, even after editing, this is going to be a, a big episode. But what a great way to start 2024. I am really excited about a lot of the stuff we get to do this year. I'm excited about a lot of the games that are coming out this year. I'm excited about a lot of the backlog games that I think we all kind of collectively know we need to get through some of your 400. I've got my shelf of shame. Andy's got some of his. We've got some great crowdfunding coming in. There's no end in sight to the really, really cool things to talk about, to be excited about. It's a great time to be a board gamer. Indeed it is. And that is going to be our January 2024 news episode. Until next time. We'll see you checking your watch and saying, man, that was a long episode at the game table. Thank you for listening and being a part of Meeple Nation. If you would be so kind as to follow, subscribe, share, and rate or review this podcast, it really helps to spread the fun. You can be more involved in supporting the podcast by joining the nation at patreon.com slash meeplenation. Or you can find a link at the top of our webpage, meeplenation.com. And while you're there, look at all our extra content. There are links to all our past episodes, a wide variety of blogs, pictures from our Instagram feed, and bios for all the hosts and our awesome bloggers. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all under Meeple Nation. If you would like to chat with the hosts or other members of the nation, you can join our Facebook group, Meeple Nation Off Air. We hope to see you again at a game night, a con, or maybe a suspense-driven evening of werewolf. Thank you for listening and supporting Meeple Nation, and stay tuned for next week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. We very much want to thank our patrons who help keep the podcast running. I personally want to thank my co-hosts for all the help they provide with both content here on the podcast in addition to what we have available on our website. Without them, the podcast would not happen. 
If you too would like to support the podcast, you can join the nation at patreon.com forward slash meeple underscore nation. Or you can find a link to Patreon at the top of our webpage, meeplenation.com. If you have any questions, comments, or games you feel should be on our radar, you can always reach us at meeplenation at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear from you. I am grateful to Doug and Andy who helped me edit episodes. And I want to thank James and Kim Clark who do the editing on our blogs and on our webpage, which can be found at meeplenation.com. We want to thank Brain Detergent for our music. If you want to find more from him, you can follow his links that can be found on our webpage or simply search for Brain Detergent on YouTube to find more of his tracks. Thank you again for listening and being part of the Meeple Nation community.